Again, my name's April Bailey. I'm an assistant professor of radiology and in the Department of, of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology. I have no disclosures. So before we start to evaluate the reproductive age patient, the most important information that will help us in choosing the right exam is knowing if she's pregnant or not. And it doesn't have to be a lab test. It can be a point of care urine test. And that will help us go down one path or the other, pregnant or not pregnant. That will help us on the diagnostic side knowing what we're worried about and what we're not worried about. A serum beta, beta HCG is only helpful if she's pregnant and we don't see a pregnancy in the uterus. So not to harp on the same theme, but I put together slides based on the ACR appropriateness criteria. The ones in black with the numbers are ones that are published already. The scenarios that I see clinically, I also included and extrapolated data from several of the recommendations. And they are based on my opinion, but also pulling in the other ones that are available. So identifying the presence of an intrauterine pregnancy in a patient with a positive pregnancy test will significantly alter management. After the initial evaluation with ultrasound, an MRI may be the best next the best next test. MRI is safe regardless of trimester in the setting of pregnancy. We do not routinely give gadolinium-based contrast in this setting. Now, if the patient is unstable, acutely ill, or injured, the fact that she's pregnant should not preclude appropriate imaging for that patient. That might include using radiation as in a CT abdomen pelvis to figure out what is going on with her. In an acutely ill patient, getting a good MRI exam can be difficult because they do need to be able to hold still. And the exam also takes more time. So in the acute setting, be it trauma or severe illness, we may jump straight to CT. So now switching to the not pregnant population. For acute pelvic pain, an ultrasound pelvis is an easy, relatively available exam that can be done on most women. Following up with an MRI of the abdomen and or pelvis with contrast. My recommendation is, is if you're not sure where it's coming from, get both, abdomen and pelvis, because I would hate to miss or incompletely see the organ of origin because we just did an abdomen or just did a pelvis. In populations that we want to avoid radiation exposure, instead of going straight to a CT abdomen pelvis if a non-GYN source is suspected, we can try MRI abdomen pelvis in a patient that we think can hold still. Another neat tool we can use in a patient of favorable <laughs> habitus is an ultrasound of the appendix. A favorable habitus for ultrasound is a smaller person. A bigger person will look great on CT, a smaller person will look great on ultrasound. <laughs> a test that we see ordered quite frequently through the emergency department because it's relatively quick is the CT <clears throat> renal colic. And unfortunately, in a young woman with acute pelvic pain, this is not always our best test to order. Now, if she has hematuria and flank pain and things really speaking to stone disease, that would be appropriate. But if appendicitis or tubo ovarian abscess, if any of this is on the radar, I would start with a different modality first. And if I had to resort to CT, then I would want contrast. Moving on to more pelvic issues, abnormal uterine bleeding or a palpable pelvic mass in a reproductive age patient. Again, ultrasound is a great way to start. Something you may not have heard of is saline infusion sonography, and that is a service we offer here. What it does is it enables us to see the lining of the uterus better by instilling sterile saline inside and then looking at the walls of the uterus. This enables us to see if there's a mass that's actually causing her bleeding. In the setting of chronic pelvic pain, not acute, Again, ultrasound is usually fine, but I will put a plug in for an MRI pelvis in this scenario. Endometriosis is a common cause of chronic pelvic pain, which we can unfortunately underdiagnose on ultrasound. 
And the surgical standard can be limited because of the disease itself, because they can't actually get into the places that are obliterated by the disease. And so MRI is a nice tool to use in this setting. For a patient who comes to you and starts complaining about infertility, a good first test, of course, is an ultrasound pelvis before the more expensive examinations, along with the referral to the specialist. So a few hormonal status generalizations. <laughs> the last menstrual period is also one of those pieces of information that we love to have in our female patients. It helps us when we're doing the ultrasound for a patient that's of the reproductive years, and it helps us to know for sure if she's truly menopausal because what is normal in a reproductive patient is not normal on imaging in a menopausal patient. The menopause means they have had no period for 12 months. The average age in Western countries is 51 to 53 years. Our management may change if she's in the first five years of menopause versus if she's after that five years. Because in the early postmenopause period, you can still have spurious ovulations, and so that would mean a cyst on your ovary may not be a neoplasm. It could still be a functional cyst. So the ACR appropriateness criteria in menopausal patients. Postmenopausal uterine bleeding and pelvic mass, again, we're starting with an ultrasound. Now, knowing if this patient is symptomatic and specifically, is she bleeding or not bleeding, also changes our criteria for when we call the lining of the uterus thickened. So that piece of clinical history, if I have an LMP that shows she's menopausal, and I have a symptom, I become much more strict in how I grade her endometrium. If I don't think that she's bleeding because I just don't know about it, somebody may pass through who shouldn't. Obesity is a significant risk factor for endometrial carcinoma. I'm seeing it in younger and younger patients, and so especially in the ob obese patients who are having heavy vaginal bleeding, um, even if she's not postmenopausal, I just wanted to put that plug in there that we should always be aware. In some places, we can offer saline infusion endometrial sampling, and this is a specialty exam where we actually sample the area of the endometrium that's of most concern to us. It has a better uh, sensitivity for detecting carcinoma when present with comparison to blind EMB. Now, in the menopausal patient who just comes to you for the first time and has a very protuberant, distended abdomen and pelvis, and everybody in the room is thinking, oh gosh, this could be ovary cancer with carcinomatosis, I would, an ultrasound pelvis may not be your best first study. A CT abdomen pelvis with or without contrast would probably show us mural nodularity better than an ultrasound. And the reason I say that is because for very large masses, ultrasound can miss mural nodules. Greater than seven centimeters, we know we have limitations. And so going straight to cross-sectional imaging in that population may be beneficial. <laughs> pelvic pain. Menopausal causes of pelvic pain are very wide. It can be related to pelvic organ prolapse, could be related to our hysterectomy and mesh placement. Most of us have seen the ads on television about the complications related to transvaginal mesh. We see a lot of those patients here. Vaginal atrophy is a potential cause. It's also with vaginal bleeding, but I wouldn't want to just assume it's due to atrophy. I'd want to make sure there wasn't something going on in her uterus first. She could have an adnexal mass or a non-GYN issue. A couple things I did want to point out. With pelvic floor dysfunction, we do offer MR defecography here. Now, don't laugh, but it's extremely informative. We place gel in the rectum and have the patient bear down and then attempt to defecate out the gel in the MR scanner. This is extreme, I know, I know. It's, <laughs> at first, the first time I giggled through the whole lecture, the first time I realized we were gonna do this, but it is so informative because on physical exam, when the pelvic floor specialists are examining them, they can underestimate the findings because of patient pain and embarrassment. 
In the MR scanner, we can see the degree of prolapse both anterior, the rectocele. We can see all of it happening real time and provide that information to the specialist. In some locations, they still do this with x-ray, and in other institutions, they can use ultrasound as well. For the patient with concerns about her transvaginal mesh or her bladder sling, the way we approach that here is a combination of ultrasound and MRI. There are strengths and weaknesses in both, and together we think we have the best answers to help our referring surgeons. Now let's talk about the younger patient, not the reproductive year. Maybe she's gone through puberty, but she's still a teenager. Acute pain is best worked up with ultrasound. Um, if she has a palpable abdominal mass, we should probably go straight to cross-sectional imaging. But if she's a smaller patient, we may be able to figure it out with ultrasound. The concerns about a transvaginal ultrasound. In young people, their habitus being favorable, we usually can get by with either a transabdominal or transperineal ultrasound. That means not a transvaginal exam, because I would hate for anxiety around that sort of study to uh, preclude them getting treatment. Transvaginal and transrectal ultrasounds usually can be deferred until after a specialist evaluation. That said, at our associated children's hospital, they will not do them with the patient awake. It's just a policy. In the patient in the teenage years, there are ways that we can figure out if it's okay or not okay to do the exam. So ultrasound is an excellent first line for smaller people, and usually the transabdominal technique can be adequate to evaluate the pelvis without going to the transvaginal exam. So for the incidental findings, the patient goes to the ER for some other cause, they get a CT, and there's a cyst on her ovary. What do I do? So for these recommendations, I will use the, the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound Consensus statement and also the ACR uh, statement on incidental asymptomatic ovarian and adnexal cysts. So during your reproductive years, functional cysts are a normal finding. They happen every month. And so if they're less than three centimeters, we're not even supposed to describe them. Anywhere between three and seven, they are still almost certainly benign, but between five and seven centimeters, we do recommend a one-year follow-up with ultrasound. At seven centimeters, that's starting to get too big. So a referral for surgical evaluation or an MRI considered by the specialist would be appropriate in that setting. In the postmenopausal patient, a simple cyst, three to seven centimeters, should be described as almost certainly benign still. It's simple in appearance, and one year follow-up should be offered. A corpus luteum cyst is also another type of functional cyst. It is a normal finding in a reproductive patient, and we will see them on ultrasound, CT, and MRI. It's a very normal finding, and it needs no follow-up because of its characteristic appearance. The hemorrhagic cyst. So during the reproductive years, if it's greater than five centimeters, we do offer the short interval six to 12 week follow-up. This is where that six to 12 week follow-up ultrasound for cysts came from. I have seen this used for symptomatic simple cysts as well, but most of the data comes from the hemorrhagic cysts. In the early post-menopause, you can have that spurious ovulation that we discussed, but the presence of hemorrhage makes me nervous, and they should have short interval follow-up. In the late postmenopause, this is not normal. This is neoplastic, and surgical evaluation should be considered. So for the incidental adnexal cystic mass that we find in patients, we have a kind of complicated algorithm that radiologists use to decide who needs an ultrasound, who needs follow-up imaging, and where do they go. But please don't let this slide stress you out. We're here to guide you, and we welcome your phone calls if it wasn't explicitly said in the report what we suggest the follow-up be. A couple additional terms we should talk about are probable diagnostic features. Now, in a patient that's not symptomatic for, from a teratoma in her ovary, 
If it's an incidental finding on a CT, which is diagnostic for this entity because of the presence of fat within the lesion, an ultrasound really is not going to add anything, so it's not needed in an asymptomatic patient. Similarly, when you have a patient who incidentally has hydrosalpinx in the tube on an ultrasound, you don't necessarily need a CT or an MRI to look at that any further. If it wasn't specific, that's the point when we would recommend maybe second tier imaging, either an ultrasound or more cross-sectional imaging to help figure out what's going on and then guide the management. The worrisome features. Things that are going to make your radiologist and you nervous are solid components, mural nodules, septations, and layering hemorrhage in postmenopausal patients. So just in summary, uh, figuring out if the patient is pregnant or not is our first diagnostic criteria in the reproductive age. An LMP is also helpful. In the postmenopause, tell us the LMP or if she's bleeding, and that will help us guide you to the right study. Ultrasound is almost always a great place to start, and MRI is safe in the setting of pregnancy, um, and most female implants, IUDs, breast implants, nor plant, tubal ligation clips, can safely go in the MR environment, usually at 1.5 Tesla. Thank you.